Boom, we're on. And this week's episode is brought to you by Platinum Wave Campers, the UK's leading stockist of luxury Volkswagen camper vans. With locations up and down the country, Platinum Wave Campers are on hand to bring your vision to life. So whether you are looking to start working on a custom built project or find your dream Volkswagen Transporter, this is a place to look. Ever dreamed of owning your own Volkswagen camper van? Well now's your chance as you can save £500 by using the code JAMES500. All you have to do is speak to one of our friendly sales team and say that James English sent you there. Now, let's get into the episode. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be and don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. Mate, we love, yeah? Yeah, we're sons, good. bro. Let's go. Like today's guest, we've got How Sonny Pike. Good, How yeah. are you, Sonny How boy? Are you? Lovely, mate. Good. So, football sensation, dubbed the next Maradona, the next George Best, legs insured for a million quid, played with Ajax, like, all over. Like I say, one of the biggest prodigies on the planet at a time. It's a um, mad story. You've released your book, which we'll plug straight away, The Greatest Footballer That Never Was, by Sonny Pike. Where can people get this, Sonny? Uh, Amazon. Yeah, it's in uh, like W. H. Smiths and all them and uh, Waterstones and them sort of places. But Amazon's the place yeah. where most people have been getting it from. Fascinating read. It brought into this, this, the kind of limelight at a very young age. Yeah, and, uh, McDonald's adverts, Coca Cola adverts. Like for such a young kid, like <coughs> it's obviously it played a massive effect on your career. Obviously, as you got older, which we'll touch on, <coughs> but. First and foremost, how are you? Good. Yeah, good. Yeah, just make my way over it today. Back in, I ain't been in the cab for a while since COVID kicked in. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a black cab driver as mm -hmm. well. So I haven't been in it for like two years. So it was quite nice coming through through London, have a little look. Uh, not in the cab. Keep going down the, the bus lanes thinking I can do everything in my normal car, which I can't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> people putting their hands up, I think I'm going to pull over and go and pick them up and whatever yeah. else. But uh, yeah, no, nah, good. Nice to be back in London and see yourself. And uh, yeah, all well, good, mate. Good, bro. As you know, I always go back to the start for my guests, yep. where you grew up and how it all began. Right. So where did it all start? It is, um, the best way to say it started is in the sound of Bow Bells. So if you're from London, Bow Churchyard is an area that's next to the uh, hospital, which is St. Bartholomew's, which is a city hospital where I was born on the 12th of the 9th, 83. So uh, I was born in the city. And they say if you're, if, you, if you're born inside the sound of Bow Bells, you're a cockney. So I was born there. So there's a lot of out of East London, inner city, South East London. I was born there, um, lived in East London, lived in Bow, above the fire station. Uh, and then where did we go? Went to Islington for a while, not far from the Arsenal football ground. And then my mum and dad sort of up sticks and moved out like a lot of families do, I suppose. They get a little bit cheaper out of London. We went to Enfield and like it, what it was, it was set up for the time when I was going to uh, primary school, uh, which was about five, six years old. So we went into there, uh, went to Enfield, and I was ready to go to uh, my primary school. At about five, six years old, we moved out to Enfield. Got two sisters. They was uh, both older than me. Uh, most of my family from East London. Dad was in. Um, my dad was into boxing, all into a big boxing family. My granddad uh, run Repton Boxing Club for twelve years. He was a club secretary there. Uh, fought Charlie Cray. Uh, Boxing environment, the whole house was sort of more boxing. No one was really football. I was sort of the black sheep, sort of playing football. Um, my dad's side of the family, both my, both families, from, uh, Hackney and Bethnal Green. My dad's side of the family, he's got like nine brothers, sisters, really a little two up and down, rammed out to the rafters, atmosphere, like cousins everywhere, hustle, bustle sort of vibe. My granddad, as I said, loved the boxing. He used to me, have me holding the cushions up in there, jabbing cushions and moving, trying to get me to be a boxer. My dad's going, no, he's, my mum don't, his mum don't want him to be a boxer. So I had that sort of hustle and bustle off my, off my dad's side, which I, which I loved. And then my mum's side was a little bit more quieter. Uh, just my nan and my mum 
and her sister and her brother, uh, my uncle Victor, a little bit more quieter. Um, and that was me, really. Yeah, as I said, we went out to Enfield and thought I was ready to go to primary school. And that sort of took me up until I was, like, say, five, six years old. Settled in in Enfield, which is quite a nice little area. Um, yeah, and that was me, really. What was school like? I liked school. Yeah, I quite. I didn't mind school. I was never one of the ones that sort of hated school. I liked the social side of it. Loved my friends. Obviously, the, mo the bit I loved most was, like, break times and lunch times because you get to play football. Uh, and at that time... As I said, no one really in my family was into football. It was all sort of boxing. And there was a couple of the kids there support Arsenal, Tottenham, that sort of area, North London. And then there was this one boy called David who supported uh, Liverpool. And at that time, it was John Barnes and Ian Rush. And all I wanted to do is just copy them. He'd tell me about them. Then I started watching them. And then we'd play at lunchtime and break time. We'd only have to have, we used to play with a stone then, like, and, but a lot of the times it used to go through the, uh, like the black iron gates go through and hit the teacher's cars and just smashing up teacher's cars and things like that. So they said they gave us the tennis ball and then we ended up getting like a softball, uh, always pretending to be Ian Rush and, and John Barnes, me and my mate David, we was always on the same team. And we should like do commentary. Like, oh, Barnes is coming down the wing. Who's going to cut it? And I'll be in the middle rush, take a touch and finish it off and we'd be celebrating. Loved, loved secondary school because of that sort of stuff. Uh, and then they made their first school team, which I played in. And it was all kids that it was about like uh, eight, nine years old, ten years old. And there was like me, five or six. Obviously, they must have thought I was good enough. And I was playing up straight away with like three or four years up. So that was all good. What was your first football team you played for? Uh, the first football team I played for was actually a team called Field End, which turned into Enfield Football Club. Yeah. And uh, I remember I played, I played up front straight away. And I think I scored 49 goals in my first season. Uh, and then, as I said, that turned into Enfield Football Club. Um, brilliant, yeah, Enfield Football. And we used to go have a, like there was a bar after and you could watch Enfield play, which was like a conference sort of team at that time. My dad would have a drink. I'd be playing pole and running around or running out on the first team pitch, getting shouted at by the groundsman. Like, and we were all having a little laugh and playing football all day. Yeah, that was the start of the start of it, yeah. Start of the madness. That pretty much, yeah. yeah. That was the start of it when <clears> I started getting really sort of looked at more because obviously Enfield weren't a bad team now. I think there was only one one division of being a professional team. And uh, yeah, and that's when it sort of all started like over Enfield playing fields, which is pretty much the equivalent of like Hackney Marshes, which over here is like 100 pitches on it or something like that. Same similar type thing in Enfield where everyone used to go. Yeah. But did you not start off as a goalkeeper? Yeah, my first, yeah, one of my first games, actually, they put me in goal for that field end game. <laughs> Why was goal. that? Uh, it was awful because um, <laughs> I remember I'd, I'd bit of very not, not played a lot of football apart from in, in, in the playground with my mate, and they put me in goal, and obviously it's gone in, and I just remember that feeling, everyone kind of, Oh, Sonny, what are you doing? What's happened? And pulling the ball out of the net. I was thinking, mate, I never want to be here again. I, never, I don't want to go in goal. Nothing to do with it. I told me dad, like, dad, just tend to put me anywhere, but, uh, but, but in goal sort of thing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, not the best. Not the best. Your name is well, Sonny. It's, your real name's Luke, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. What's the, the connection to do with the Godfather? All right, yeah, because my, my name's Luke Santino. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Santino is the guy in Godfather, isn't he? Sonny. So he's actually in, in Italian, Sonny means Santino. So uh, yeah, so it's Santino out of, uh, out of the Godfather and uh, obviously Sonny Liston as well. As I said, big boxing family. So it was other, probably, if you yeah. could ask me, Dad, that's where it's probably come from. I like Sonny as a name anyway. It is a strong name. Is, yeah, yeah. I do like Sonny. So when you started kind of going through the ranks at football, like when did you realise you had a talent? Um, was that from an early age or did that take time? I think the fact that the first thing was that I knew I could score goals. I was, I, I, was, I was pretty good around the box and I'd score a lot of goals sort of thing compared to most other kids in the league. Uh, another big thing I think I'd sort of in my favour, I thought um, I stood out a little bit more was my actual mindset. Um, going into the games, even at a young age, I was pretty hungry to win. Pretty, and there was a lot of kids there who were just playing sort of uh, for fun, which don't get me wrong, I did. But I had this sort of mindset built into me quite early that winning was important. And if we're not going to give our best, then we don't, we don't want to bother turning up. Uh, certain things that I remember from when I was young, actually going through the book, just talking to you now, is making me remember some of the things. 
I remember Mike Tyson fought uh, Bruno the first time they fought, and I think I was about <clears throat> six years old. It was on, like, say, four o'clock in the morning. And uh, I came downstairs. My dad was down there. We'd not long moved into the house in Enfield. I'm down there with my uncle, and obviously it's like three or four o'clock in the morning. I've peeped around now. I want to watch it. I don't want to get told off, obviously. But then my dad said, I'm hiding behind the couch. He said, go on, come up here. I've gone, sat up on his lap, and I'm watching it now. And then you remember when Tyson used to walk out into the, in, into the ring, mate, he could feel the atmosphere in my living room as if it was about to go off. I was like, whoa, what's going on? He's walking out, you know, he was just fearless, wasn't he? And they've gone and put up next to each other. And uh, I said, dad, who's going to win? I'm not, I ain't got a clue. I'm looking at Bruno, I'm thinking Bruno's bigger. I'm saying this guy, this Bruno's got to win. And he's going, nah, he said he's lost the fight already. I said, what do you mean? He said, look at Tyson. He said he fucking means it. He said he's going to, he's like mentally, like that mental sort of side of it, he'd beaten him already. And you could see when he's, when there's, I think there's actually a clip when he's side to side and you can see Tyson's eyes, he's on him. And, he, and you can just, and you can, and Bruno's looking at him and you think, oh. you could just tell something in that look. And, and, and I, I sort of kept that with me when I started to play football. I started to play football and I was just like a, a kid on a mission. Do you know what I mean? I grabbed the ball, bang, anything, half an inch, get round the defender, bang, I'm shooting. In the box, I'm shooting. I must have been like not the best person to play with because I was pretty greedy. <laughs> mm, yeah. But I had that sort of side to me as well. And then and I could finish. I, yeah. could, I, I could finish. When did you start getting attention <coughs> towards your playing career? How um, young were you? Uh, I was a, quite, quite young. I want to say about seven or eight years old. I remember the, one of the first things, a guy called Graham Roberts who plays for Tottenham, he put on like a summer camp and... Uh, they did um, like a penalty shootout competition from all the ages, from like say six to 16, and then ended up winning the penalty shootout competition for my age. And then the winner who won the whole thing out of all the ages ended up in the no local newspaper. And I beat like the 16 year old and I was only like say seven or eight. And I got to, uh, it was like for charity as well. So that was my first time I got a little clip in the newspaper of me winning this competition with Graham Roberts and this, that and the other. And then off the back of that, people was watching me at Enfield. And then I'll just get a little tiny write up in the adver local advertisers, it's like Sonny scores a clear winner or Sonny Pike's doing well, this, that and the other. And it'd just be like local newspapers really. Did you enjoy it at that time? Was that exciting yeah. for you? That was the best time because the pressure and, and everything else wasn't, uh, wasn't really nothing. I mean, they knew me locally in the clubhouse and this, that, and I was just like, oh, that's Sonny, yeah. He's not a bad little player. But that's all it was. Do you know what I mean? It weren't like Sonny's going to take on the world and win us the World Cup mm -hmm. sort of thing. So it was quite nice. I, I, could, I, could, I could deal with that pressure. Oh, it was fine. I sort of thrived off it in some ways. So I think like the local teams would come in and want to be, oh, we're going like, to turn Sonny's team over. And I'd be like, no, go on, I'm going to show you. Mm -hmm. And, and I, sort of, I sort of thrived off it, if anything. What is, did you start feeling a bit of pressure? Um, I think more so like, I mean, I mean, just sort of jumping on a little bit from when I was 10 years old, they put me on London tonight, which is like the news. And, uh, it was like, uh, that song, we're going to make you a star. I can't remember his song, his song by, and it was me. And it was like a little clip, a little like five minute clip. And they interviewed me, played me, watched me, film me playing a game. And, uh. I done really well in this game. It was like four one or something like that, and I scored all four goals, taking on the goalkeeper. And they must have thought, bloody hell, I've got like yellow, like gold sort of boots, long hair. I stand out like a sore thumb, and I'm scoring goals, and I'm on the telly. And then from that one, when it went on to London tonight, that's when I thought it still, it went up a gear. That was like sort of ten years old, uh, and that wasn't out of control. But by the time, because it was like between ten and fourteen, when I got the most exposure but I'd say from the middle onwards when I came back from Ajax which is a little bit after the uh, the uh, news article and it was in London tonight when I came back from Ajax that's when I started to feel the pressure because it went up to another level when did you go to Ajax with age I was 12 and how did you end up over there um, well that actual that thing was on the news at London tonight I think uh, they caught wind of it in Holland <clears throat> Because in some of the questions they asked me, they was asking me my favourite players, and I started talking about Cruyff and Maradona. And they was asking me my favourite teams. I was talking about Boca Juniors, Santos, 
and they're like, what's this little kid talking about? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I was really into the sort of technical and the flair side of it really at a young age because my dad bought me this videotape and it had Maradona, Pele and Cruyff on it. Cruyff done. Yeah, yeah. And so I would just put that in the, in, in the video and just watch it religiously and I'll just be looking at all the skills. I was really into that. And obviously back then the game was completely different. We was playing on a full-size pitch, right? And then thick mud, you can just about get the ball out of the box if you was a goalkeeper. I used to wait at the edge of the box, just take a touch and shoot. Um, and I'm talking about skills and technical, and it wasn't like that, was it? It was just, just like mm -hmm. bite, bollock, bite, and everything you've got, you got to do to win type thing. And I was talking about that on the interview. I was talking about skills. I was talking about technique. And I think they caught wind of that in, in, in Holland. And then not long after, my dad just rang me up and he said, I've had a phone call. Like, you could go to Finoid or you could go to Ajax. When he said Ajax, I thought, oh, Cruyff, straight away. And I thought, well, let's go to Ajax. <laughs> yeah. Was there any, who was, because they, they had like Clive here coming through the ranks. They had like so many, the Dutch players back then, especially in the 90s. Like, they, I think they changed the training regime. It was all kind of one touch and pass and That's move. Like, they did change the game. Well, as far as I'm aware, in the 90s, I used to. They did. Playing football in Scotland, but it was just kind of long ball header on, and, exactly, and hopefully yeah, somebody's yeah, yeah. fucking <laughs> they collect it. Like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah. obviously they, and I remember in the late nineties you used to see like the Ajax kids because there was players coming through at 16, 17, 18 and yeah, a, few, a good few of the Dutch came through at that time. Was there any of them in that over in Holland when you were there? Yeah. So so when I went there, I always remember actually. Um, we was having something to eat, and there had a guy there talking to me, and was getting ready to train. I was there for a trial for like a week. And uh, actually, it was Van Gaal. And I was with my dad. Van Gaal came in and, he, and I was having a cup of tea. And he gave me some biscuits and put them aside. So I'm having it. And my dad's like, Who's this? I said, That's Van Gaal. That's the first team manager. And my dad's like, I ain't got a clue. I said, Probably thought it was like doing a sweeping up or something. Do you know what I mean? Never had a clue. But he went to me, If you want, son, go downstairs and watch the first team train. So actually, how it was set up at that point, because it was at the old stadium, that the first team training was here. The, the stadium was there and the academy was at the back. So he said, go downstairs and go out the front and watch the first team train. So I was like, whoa, I went down there, I was gone. And there was like a chain link fence around it and I was holding on to it and I looked in there and I could see uh, Overmars, uh, Lippmann, uh, I think Bergkamp was there, um, the, the Boer brothers and Canoe. And that's the one they told me to watch. He went, when you go down there, watch a boy called Canoe. Big guy, big black guy. I was like, yeah, okay. He's only, I think he was only meant to be about three or three years older than me at that point. I think he was meant to be 16 or 17. And I was like, say 12. So I was like, all right, I'll watch him. So I watched him. And like, obviously the experience, just watching him train, um, it was unbelievable. I'm holding onto the fence, just like, what? what's going on? Mm -hmm. Like seeing him do certain things. And then back at the hotel at the night, actually not at the hotel, at the digs, they gave us like a little, a guy called uh, Tom Pronk, who was the defender. He was running the academy. He gave us a place to stay. Uh, I was back in the room trying this sort of skill that I see Yari Lippmann was doing and I was just practicing it and practicing it and practicing it. So yeah, I mean, it was unbelievable. Would you practice every day with yeah. the ball? Yeah, yeah, every day. Every what day. sort of drills were you doing? I used to do a lot of stuff off the wall. So I'd just find a wall, you know, like say same playing spot, I'd pop it off the wall, take a touch out of my body, cruff, and then pop it off with my left foot, take a touch out of my body, cruff, and just sort of things like that. Were you left footed? I was right footed, but I've got to say, after a while, I was pretty much close to both footed because I used to be on the wall nonstop. Like Bergkamp did that. I actually took that from Bergkamp. Bergkamp used yeah. to do a lot of stuff off the wall. He's Just, one of the greatest players I've yeah. seen in the, in the Premier League. Like, Unreal. He's one of my favourite players. Yeah. Just start touching the ball, the outside, the foot. Just getting so comfortable with the ball. And that's and that's what I did when I came back home. He just made it look so easy, especially his touch. I don't know if it was his goal for Holland, but like he brought it down and that's it, yeah, yeah. Just thinking like just stuck to his feet like glue. You see the one against uh, Newcastle as well when he comes and he touches it with the outside of the boot, yeah, spins it around yeah, him, yeah, yeah, runs yeah. around yeah. him. Can't do that to people. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Can't yeah, do yeah. that to people. <laughs> so what <laughs> happened after your week trial then? Uh yeah, so I, I came back from my trial when actually when I was on the trial, uh, Blue Peter was there. Uh, Transworld Sport, remember them? Yeah. Football Old Mondial. School. And there was a couple of other uh, Dutch company, uh, TV companies out there sort of filming my whole trial, my whole experience. Uh, in in the trial is where it actually, you can actually, looking back at it now, you can actually find out to see what was going on and how it was going to turn out, let's say. In the trial, I was doing quite a lot of media stuff. So I'd, I'd go for 
my training and then I'd have to go media. And then on the end, at the end of the week, they was like, there's a game on Saturday, uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. So I was like, all right, dad, this is, this is obviously a big game sort of thing. He said, but yeah, in the, the night after he said, they want you up at five in the morning. They want you in Amsterdam doing kickups before it, when it's dark and, and then it's going to like sort of become bright. They want you doing the kickups in the street. I'm like, yeah, but dad, I've got a game at one o'clock. Like, do you know what I mean? I don't want to overdo it. I want to be fresh. He said, well, we've got to do it. We've got all these camera crews here. We've got to do what we've got to do. And I'm like, it's sort of ruining what I'm trying to trying to achieve. Do you know what I mean? So it's a sort of bit of a bit of an eye opener. Anyway, I ended up doing that. I, I, I played the last game and we drew one all and I scored from outside the box, but I was knackered. I'd done like five or six hours media work prior to that from like five, six in the morning until like 12 o'clock. They had me at the flower market. They had me doing interviews in calves. They had me doing kickups in the street, this, that and the other. And then I go to play the match and I'm like, like, do you know what I mean? So that was a bit of a bit of writing on the wall. I, anyway, so I come back from, from that trial. Uh, the camera crews have all come back to England as well and see me open like the letter from Ajax in my garden where like my whole family was. We was all together, all my sisters and my mum, but really my family was actually breaking apart at that point. Like my, my dad had left, he weren't living with us, but it was all put together for the camera. Do you know what I mean? It was all sort of there, we was all sitting there, oh. Then anyway, I open up the letter. They say technically I'm as good as what they've got because all the players out there was really technically good. Yeah, I, I, was, I was pretty similar. Uh, but they wanted me to come back every quarter, like every three months and keep and keep an eye on me and sort of that was going to be the the idea anyway. Uh, that didn't end up happening because obviously all the other stuff that ended up happening next. Was it when you were doing all the interviews and all the magazines, were you, were you getting paid for that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't, maybe not as much first of all, but then after a while they started to sort of yeah. send some money. Because in your book, obviously it says your mum and dad's <laughs> you struggled a lot and there was a lot of fights behind yeah. the scenes that you figured out later do you think your dad not realising at the time but try to just get as much money as he can just to provide for the family obviously not knowing the stresses it's putting on yourself that's, that's, that's the thing I think it just got to a stage where it's like probably didn't even expect it to go to the lengths it did and just thought right let's just get what we can now instead of sort of thinking long term like now, I'm always forever thinking like what I'm going to do five, ten years down the line. Do you know what I mean? But yeah. like, yeah, I think I think that's what happened. Yeah. What was the story in the book when you're out with your friends on the bike and you drove to the bridge, suicide bridge? Yeah. So I was. Um, How old were you? I was at that age. I was fourteen. So from from to sort of break it down the best way, I'd, I'd been back from my axe. Uh, I'd end up becoming like real famous when I come back from my axe. It took me to another level. Like I was doing, like you said earlier, McDonald's adverts. I was the Coca-Cola kid. They'd bring me out in the middle of the pitch at Wembley before like Leeds and Villa. Here comes Sonny Pike, the Coca-Cola kid. And shh, go up into the middle pitch, do the like the uh, Baggy 07, off one foot, off one leg and this, that and the other, uh, all the skills. Uh, I was doing Sabutio things. I was doing things actually that was going out in towards America. I did the first Disney magazine that come to England. I got all sort of high profile. I was getting, you remember Sky Sports, they used to do an award ceremony every year in 95 and 96. So in other words, like, you know, like your, your, your team, as they, at the end of the year, they give out their awards. They was doing it on Sky. Like obviously, Sky was just getting big into football and they were starting to get that sort of crossover. It's becoming sort of celebrity and football at that time. And they was doing, and they was doing all the um, sort of stuff for that. And I used to get the award. I got the award for like the youngest player in 95. I'll be there with like Nassim, Hamid and Eubank and this, that and the other, getting my award. In 96, I got it as well. Um, yeah, so that, that I, I, went to an, I went to another level sort of, a sort of stardom and then it all sort of come sort of tumbling down in some ways and then, and then I found myself, uh, I found myself on that bridge because 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 of all the stardom that it sort of went into it started happening and it started to become like my football started to become second before be, be becoming like a, a celebrity let's say uh and i found myself me, me and my dad was going back and forth a little bit like my dad would be sort of really pushing for me to do this that and the other and i'd be like dad yeah but i just want to play football really do you know what i mean and 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 the key point was they, they made a documentary that ended up being aired on channel four 
It was called Fair Game. And it was about, uh, it was, I was told it was just about me doing really well in, in, in football and hopefully going to be this next player. It was me, Scott Parker was in it. There was a few other players in it. Uh, but it was actually called Coaching and Poaching. It was a part of a four-part series. And the fourth part was it, it was called Coaching and Poaching. And that was, and that was me. And it was uh, made by Greg Dyke, who ended up running the FA. Uh, this is where it gets a little bit like, I found myself in a position like, well, what, what am I going to do? Because he, 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 he made the show and it was me being at Leighton Orient, but being sort of tapped up by Chelsea. And they would film me at Orient and then they filmed me behind the scenes. They got like a camera to come behind the curtains. It was in an indoor sports hall. And there was this guy sort of filming me with a little camera and uh, in Ch at Chelsea. And then they put it out on the TV and made Chelsea look really bad which, to be fair to Chelsea, I didn't even do nothing wrong because I wasn't even signed at Leighton Orient anyway. I was, I'd was i been there for a year or two, but I wasn't officially signed. I could, I could have... Uh, my dad signed the papers. My mum was meant to sign the papers. Um, so I ended up going out onto, on Channel 4 and off, the, and off the back of that, mate, I knew that looked really bad on me. Do you know what I mean? It looked terrible. Uh, and I fell out on my dad over it. And then uh, that's when I led to the situation you said why terrible though a kid at 14 want to talk to other teams why was it so bad uh, I mean the fact that they made it look like they just sort of tapped they sort of tapped me up and I, I should be signed here because like Greg Dykes going to the to the Leighton Orient coach is like if we had a video of Sonny Pike playing for Chelsea what would you say and they say well we've heard rumours actually that Sonny could be at Chelsea because I'm going to be as far as they're concerned I'm, I'm a Leighton Orient player and then They've, showed, they've actually showed the video. Oh, no, there he is. Look, he's playing for Chelsea. He's been tapped up by Chelsea. So it, it, it looked like I'm playing both sides. Do you know what I mean? It, it didn't look good. Uh, Chelsea completely said, no, obviously, what's happened? We can't, you can't come and play with us anymore. And then Orient was just like, a, obviously, look like I've, I've done them wrong sort of thing. And you got a year banned for I that? I got a ban for that. Ended up in the Strand. Yeah, because I got a ban. Because my, my mum took my dad to court over... Uh, because he just kept publishing stuff about me nonstop. And my mum ended up in court with him. And then at the same time, uh, I got banned for a year that I couldn't play for any sort of, uh, like, it was not academy then, it was school of excellence, if you remember back then. Mm -hmm. I said, you can't play at any school of excellence for the rest of this year season. And then... And then, and then a year banned at 14? Yeah, I know. <laughs> the world's at your feet. How did, when did your legs get insured for a million quid? That was at the back end. No, no something I say the back end. I'm about 14 years old. I'm telling yeah. you, it's the back end. Do you know what I mean? But that's how it was in my mind. Yeah. Like, that was like, yeah, it was just another thing that happened. So do you feel as if your world crashed then at 14? All you ever wanted to do was play football. Yeah, um, at 14, yeah. And then you were out cycling with your friends and then you've seen this bridge, it's, was it Suicide Bridge yeah. it's called? People jump from it every other week and yeah. you've been driving over the bridge in your bike and you've let your, your friends... That's it, yeah. Yeah, pedal on, is that correct? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Because obviously all, all that had sort of built up and everything that had happened and it had become to a big sort of thing where I wasn't really talking to my dad. And my dad, and I was still training with my own coach. I got my own, I had my own coach. His name's an old guy called Terry, Terry Welch. Like, I mean, a diamond of a fella. Just do anything for you. Didn't ever want anything. Just wanted to help me. Uh, and I used to train with him on, on, on our own, like a little bit of a one-to-one -one sort of stuff. And I hadn't spoke to my that 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 fair game interview had, had aired, and I hadn't seen my dad for a good few weeks, and that wasn't like him. Do you know what I mean? So I think he knew the writing was sort of on the wall because it was the first for a, for a few years. It was a bit of a tussle. My mum was saying like, "Son, just concentrate on your football." But like, being a bit wary about my dad. Dad broke up already. Yeah, and my dad saying she's saying stuff to you to sort of get you away from me. I was caught in the middle of all this sort of family stuff. Do you know what I mean? Like the mum and dad sort of thing. Um, and anyway, I'm training with Terry and then he sort of turned up, uh, on his, and just turned up and, and comes sunny. So I walked over to him and I said, uh, he said, he said, I've got some more work for you. I said, what do you mean? He said, some more like TV media work. I said, dad, I said, this has come out on the telly a few weeks ago. I said, you know, that's enough. I've had enough now. I've ain't been wanting to do it for a while, but now this has come out. I said, I just want to carry on my football. That's what I want to do. And what he said to me stays with me, James, honestly, for the rest of my life. Because he goes to me, if you, if, if you don't do it, he said, you ain't got a dad no more. And fucking, I can tell you, I can feel it in my throat now. Because 
I didn't expect that. I expected him to say, all right, let's just leave it. Even if he just says, sack the football, leave the sort of media stuff. I just didn't want him to be dad. Do you know what I mean? But when he said that to me, it fucking hurt me. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. um, I ended up going back training uh, with Terry. I told him what he said. And then from that day, I hadn't spoke to my dad until today. Um, and then I found myself a couple of weeks later, like what you said, uh, actually over the park. I only live like, say, 45 minutes from central London. Even though it's just, it's, it's just North London, we went out on our bikes and uh, we'd been into central London and on the way back, I see the bridge. And as I was coming up to the bridge, I knew what bridge it was. And I just sort of let, it's at the top of the, at the top. And I just let my mates go down. I just pulled my bike back and then I just walked back towards the bridge. And I uh, just thought I stopped and had a little look over it. And uh, for the first time in my life, I started thinking to myself, fuck it, I'm gonna throw myself off it. Um, which was weird for me, because I'm just not that character, do you know what I mean? But it was really out of sort of character for me, but that's how I felt. And, I, and it weren't like sort of premeditated. I just drove past it and I just had this feeling that I had to pull my bike over and go and look over and started to feel that way, do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's sad. All you wanted to do was play football. How much like, resentment do you hold towards your dad? Do you feel as if that was at the start of your downfall, that he pretty much caused that as well? Because you clearly had the talent to be whatever you wanted to be, but... Getting that extra added pressure with the media. Listen, there's people now that like, I struggle with press and media. Yeah. And I'm in my fucking thirties. Like for a kid at 10, yeah, yeah. 12, 14, like it's tough. They don't understand it. It's all good at the start when you're at school and your kids' friends are talking about you being in a paper, but then when you want to play football you're getting dragged up at five in the morning yeah, to yeah. then do it like how much do you do you hold any resentment towards your dad for No, nah, not now. Nah. Nah, yeah, not I now, but I back think, then. I'm back then. Yeah, I think in some ways I think I did. I just felt like he was just trying to pull me in a different direction. Like he was trying to make me into, he says like, it's a backup. If you can become like a celebrity, you can become a TV producer, a, a TV, uh, a show host or something. I'm thinking, I don't give a shit about being a show host. Like, yeah. I, I don't watch Andy Peters and think, oh, I want to be, like, no, yeah. I love Andy Peters, his quality, by the way. But like, you know, I don't, that weren't my thing. Mm -hmm. I was watching the footballers. I was watching the players like yeah. Gazza and that. I love Gazza. I was watching him. That's, that was my thing. And it was just like, trying to just push me in an area I didn't really want to go in. He's probably not understood that he's self. It's obviously been all new to him. Like yeah. you say that in the book, they were struggling as well. He's yeah. just trying to make as much money as he can. The money's come in. Yeah. And he's probably not seen the effects that it did have on you. No. But, so again, after that, after the bridge and banned for a year, what was, going, what was your life like then? We still could you still play for amateur teams or like yeah. school? What was it? Yeah, so that's what we did. Actually, my my coach, I was sort of by this time, sort of my dad's sort of out of the picture from now on. Um, and my old coach Terry, he he finds me a little club in in Essex now, and it's just a normal sort of grassroots side. Really, we went and played there for a year, and I was like, say, I want to say fifteen. So it's up between fourteen and fifteen. I did that for a year, and he was just just like, just let everything calm down. I could see exactly what he was thinking. He was just like, just because mentally I was sort of shot to bits. Like before I ended up on that bridge, I spent weeks in bed where I just couldn't get out of bed. And my mum would come to the door and say to me, you're right, son. I said, no, I don't feel well. But I couldn't explain to her and say like, I feel sick or I've hurt me leg. It was just like, mentally, I was just looking at myself in the mirror and just think, fucking I've had enough of this shit. Do you know what I mean? It was like, it's a big mental thing. And Terry was just like, let's just bring him away. Just put him in a, little side team and and let him enjoy his football which 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 we did and then i mean that last year going in towards like 16 is when the year we decided like right let's try and make a move now and try and get like some sort of signing in for a club like a, a bigger club so we can sort of settle back in and then hopefully become a football player which which we did i ended up uh at queens park rangers uh for a season and then at the, I never got nothing at the end of that season. And then I went to Crystal Palace for a couple of games. But this is like an 18-month period, a bit further on. I went and played for Crystal Palace for a while. And then it sort of reared back up again because I hadn't seen my dad or heard from my dad for a couple of years, say 18 months. And I was at Palace. And then I played. Uh, and then a, a big thing come out in the news of the world, a double page spread family uh, football rips my family apart and at that time like the news of the world like you know not no, like social media is a million platforms like so it was everywhere like middle big double page spread in the middle of the news of the world and people just coming up to me going what's happening son what's happening son I was like fucking hell and Palace had called me in the, 
the day after and said, we want you to play in a game on Wednesday against Tottenham. I was like, okay. And I went onto the pitch at Tottenham and I think the pressure, because of that had just come out a few days before, the pressure I put on myself in this game that I had to sort of just do things that was probably fucking not possible. Do you know what I mean? I think every time I've got to get the ball, I've got to take someone on. I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And then I just took a couple of touches and I was just like, I felt like the ground, honestly, it felt like the ground was sucking me up. I was just like, what the fuck am I doing out here? And I just went to the manager. I said, uh, I said I've got to come off, I'm injured. And there was nothing wrong with me, but fucking mentally, I was just completely shot to bits. Um, went back into the changing room and I was 16 then. Uh, and, and then that was that, was that part. Uh, and then I ended up at Stevenage. I ended up at Stevenage, which is like a, I mean, they're a professional team now, but that was a conference team. I ended up at Stevenage at 16 years old, playing for Stevenage. How was that when your career kind of is, is going down the way? Uh, just spiralling where you had the world at your feet for like 10, 12 massive teams, mm. all those sponsorships, all the media, and then not want to play, walking off the pitch to then at Stevenage, like... What are you thinking then? Was that when you just kind of fell out of love of football? Did you not have the same drive? Yeah, the drive had gone. I had plenty of... Burnt think, out, basically? Yeah, plenty of maybe natural ability and this, that and the other. Actually, when I went to Stevenage, the guy there, Malcolm Allen, who played for Wales, Newcastle, he said to me, son, you've got so much ability. I've never seen someone with a Stevenage shirt have so much natural ability. But um, I, I didn't have the, the drive, the desire, completely gone. It was like a two-year course at Stevenage. So it was like, a, like an apprenticeship type thing. But um, I was more looking forward to doing a couple of days in the college with the lads and having a laugh sort of thing. I weren't really interested. That people would be t and then, But there'd be kids there that had never been to a, t a team as big as Stevenage and there was everything. There was at every session, giving it everything. And I'm like, I was at the I was at the back end. I was I was done sort of thing. And I mean, I was taking advantages of the opportunities. And I'm just like, I couldn't give a shit what happens, really. How hard does that then? But like, having the world at your feet, then kind of just losing the passion for something that you love so much and something that you thought you'd have been the greatest at. It was it was tough because the truth is, even when I went to Stevenage, I made a, a conscious a conscious decision with my coach Terry, my friend Daniel Buck, and my mum. Danny Buck was a good friend of mine. Before we went to Stevenage, he was just like, don't even think about being a football player. It was just like, um, just go there and try and enjoy it. But the truth is, I didn't know anything else what to do. Like, all my friends was going to do other things. There was a lot of them doing building or whatever else, or get, coming out of school. But I, was, I, saw, I felt really lost because, I, as I said, I just didn't know what else what to do. So I, I sort of see that out for a while uh, until I was, like, say, 17, 18, and then I became sort of doing what I wanted and I just and I just copied a lot of my mates and I ended up doing a bit of labouring and working on a sort of building site. Did you get asked a lot of questions at that age? Like obviously when you're playing football at 15, 16, I imagine there'd be a lot more pressure. People expecting you to be doing fucking overhead kicks yeah, every yeah. chance you get and beating five and six men. Like, did you feel as if you had to perform at Stevenage as well as like Crystal Palace? Like, did you feel as if you always had pressure to be the best on the pitch? Uh, I think I always had that pressure. I think I mean I always had that pressure, but the pressure within, in, within myself by the time I got to Stevenage wasn't the same. Before that, I'll be like, I was, I had a bit of bite on me, or a bit more back, and I'd be like, no, I don't give a shit. Like, you got, you want to put pressure on me? I'm going to give it back to you. But by the time it got to Stevenage, I'd sort of been burnt. Like you said, I was burnt out. I didn't really care if I played well or not sort of thing do you know what I mean where before I was using that energy when I was say 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 uh, not 15 with them young but so you say 14 I would use that energy to show them and, and it actually worked in my favour because mm -hmm. I'd be like I'd get more geared up for it I weren't worried about sort of I didn't worry about pressure about uh, uh, that much but I think when I when I came back on that bike after that journey I sort of made a decision that I had to sort of really sort myself out because I could have sort of easily spiralled and been in a position where I could end up probably getting maybe sectioned or even hurting myself or something could have happened. And uh, I knew I had to sort of put that first and football became sort of second. Yeah, I think it's changed now for kids. I think a lot more kids are wrapped up in cotton wool. Yes, you've got the social media side of things, but I think the big teams now are really, really protecting the kids. Mental health is a massive thing all around the world now. Like, yeah. Do you think if you were in this either, it would have been better for you? Because that's, you're kind of the first in the firing line you're 
basically the one there, the showman, the kind of the circus to yeah. be doing all those acts at such a young age. That yeah. wouldn't happen now. Like no. you'd be guided, you would be media trained and just try to be guided in a better way. Like, wait a minute, this is too much. This is too much for anybody yeah. that's already in that industry. Yeah, Never mind like, a kid um, at ten kid. and twelve. Do you know what I mean? Like, see when you ended up because you would you give up football at eighteen? 18, 19, yeah. And then would you just pick up the tools and become a... Yeah, I actually did a, a, a chippy course, become a chippy. I did that um, for a few years. Uh, and then I ended up obviously doing the knowledge and everything else to be a black cab driver. But yeah, I, I picked up the tools and jumped on site. People coming on site going, Sonny, what are you doing here? Like, like, do you know what I mean? Expect me with football, this, that and the other. The amount of times I used to get pulled up in people's jobs and this, that and the other. What kind of players did you play with back in the day that eventually kicked on and made that? And uh, Ashley, uh, Ashley Young, uh, David Bentley. Uh, was Joe Cole ever about you? Joe age? Cole was a, a, a couple of years older than me. Because he was kind of the same. He got forced into this spotlight yeah. as yeah, a young yeah. kid. Actually, it's quite funny, actually, because I was playing a game uh, for Palace. Cheers, James. I was playing a game for Palace. And um, as we were playing the game, I'm, I'm doing bits on the way and, and you could feel an atmosphere change. Someone had walked onto the side of the pitch. You know when someone's come to the side of the pitch because everyone's looking sort of thing. And after the game's finished, someone's gone, son, this was just when I was just sort of getting, trying to get back into it again when I said, I'm going to try and get back into the pro clubs and that. Um, Alex Ferguson was watching the last 20 minutes of that game. I went, yeah? And I went, okay. So I thought, fuck this, I've got to see if it's him or not. He'd walked off by then, but he had a big long jacket on. Remember them big like umbros, them big long ones yeah. that come down young. He'd walked off by then and he was watching another game. And my game had finished. So I thought, I've got to go over there and see if that's him. So I've gone onto the sideline. I think it was West Ham was playing Palace. And uh, he's and he's on the side of the pitch and he's and he's watching the game. And I'm behind him and I'm trying to make a few noises and doing a few things behind him. So he turns around so I can see if it was Alex Ferguson or not, who was watching the game or not. Turned around, it was him. Um, and I looked on the pitch, I thought, who's he watching? And I, I watched for five, ten minutes, and you could just see this kid in the middle, just popping it over people's heads, putting it through their legs, like in rubbing their heads and mucking about. And like it was at the park. I thought, who's that? I was like, That's Joe Cole. And then I think a couple of weeks later, he put a bid in for him, like 10 million pounds or whatever else. Yeah, so I got to see Joe Cole then, and I thought, fucking hell. He was one of the players I looked at, I thought, he's good. He's good. And actually, watching that game, about two or three weeks later, I found out they was playing at Leighton Orient, and I got on a bus on my own. It took me about half hour from where I live. I got a bus on my own about 14, 15, and went and watched it. I thought, fucking hell, I've got to watch this. He's, he was proper. He mm -hmm. was good. He was really good. What was it like that you eventually just decided enough was enough? 18, 19? What was the what? Sorry. What was the feeling like for you? Oh, I don't know. I think it'd gone on for so long. I was just just so happy to be doing something different. Relief. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it was just more of a relief. Yeah, mm. it, actually, weirdly enough, when when the Stevenage thing finished up in the in the changing room, they found out if anyone was going to get any pro contracts. I found myself consoling people, going to me, "Well, oh, don't worry, mate, you'll be all right." And I'm thinking, really, it should have been me going like, oh, "But I'd gone so much already." I'm going. And a couple of the kids got right ups. A couple of lads in my team was getting right upset. And I'm going, don't worry, mate. I said, you'll be all right. I said, you'll find this, that, and the other. Because I'd been through so much shit already. Yeah. I found myself in a position sort of trying to help them out. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So <laughs> what, ha what, was your, what happens then with your life after you gave up football? Oh, this is the fucking, this is the bit really where uh, in, in my book and in my story, I think to myself, this is the bit, well, obviously that's not normal what's gone on already. But then obviously normal life sort of kicks in. You end up in, in pubs and everything else. And uh, my mum gets a new boyfriend who ends up coming to live with us. Uh, he's in the book. Um, and then I just sort of, I, what, I, what I tried to do is I tried to sort of hold myself out of a position where I was going to get myself into any trouble or start getting drunk or taking drugs nonstop. I tried to keep myself out of that environment as much as I could. So what I actually did when I stopped playing, I went, uh, an agent called me up. Remember Sky, and you know, Sky Andrews is a football agent. No. It rang me up. It was like, I was like 19. I played football for a year. He said, Sonny, could you come down to my office, please? I was like, yeah, all right, no worries. It was like in Woodford, not, not far around the corner. Lovely day. I just brought a new car. So I was like, all right, I'll just take a little ride down. I've got nothing to lose. As I've gone down there, he's gone to me. Um, Sonny, he's like, he's like Sol Campbell's agent, Jermaine Pennant's agent. He's, he's, he's really well known. I've gone in there 
And he's gone to me, oh, Sonny, you all right? I said, yeah, you all right? He went, um, do, you think you, uh, do you think you can play in the championship? Do you think you can play Premier League? I said, well, technically, I said, I think I'm good enough, but I said, I've been out of it for a long time. And I said, like, I'm not really fit. I ain't really done nothing. He said, oh, can you go and see someone else? Uh, uh, he got another couple of people that work for him, a guy called Coz and another, uh, another girl, lovely, nice people. And um, I've gone in there and she's gone, the guy's gone to me, Remember the, uh, what was that program? There was a football program every week. Uh, it's like sort of a Grange, Grange Hill, but it was football related. What is it called? I'm not sure. Not fantasy football. Cause that's the other program with Frank Skinner and all that I was on. Mm. It, was another, it was another football program. It was a team. Oh, fucking, it's going to annoy me now. But, and it was, like, it was on TV every week. And they wanted me to be an actor in it and play myself as a team. That's going to proper bug me. Anyway, it'll come back to me later. Yeah. But, and they wanted me to be in the, pro, in, in, to be in the program and, uh, and, and play myself. So I went for an interview and we went and done a bit of casting and this, that and the other. And they said, right, if you keep, get, you, you keep going, we're going to get you back in and uh, you, can be, you can be in it. I'm still trying to think in the back of my nut what this team is, <laughs> what this program was. You'll know it as soon as I say it. Anyway, I've gone and done that. And I put myself into acting school. For like six, for about six weeks, I thought if I stay with this acting thing, maybe that'll keep me away from the sort of pub and sort of going and doing everything else. But I, I only lasted about three weeks. Right? I got to like the, the, the third week in on a Friday, and all my mates are ringing me in the pub and saying, "Son, what are you doing?" I said, oh, well, we're, "We're in the George. We're having a drink." Blah blah blah. So I told the fellow who was doing a bit of, oh, I'm going to be doing a bit of acting, and, we, and I said, "I've got to go," and ended up in the pub and ended up sort of spiraling into the next sort of phase where I'm in the pub toilet and people are talking, shout this, that and the other, you're having a drink, offering you this, that and the other. And then I thought, fuck it. And, I, and then I took a, I took a sharp left. Yeah. So. Sat, sat, in the, <laughs> sat in the pub saying I could have been a contender, I could yeah. have been a baller. Like, that's the hard thing because when I gave up football, I never gave it up, I always always kind of played but the teams just kind of get worse and worse and worse like, and then but I used to watch the people who I played with I want to tell you and I used to hold resentment I used yeah. to hold grudges and think bastard he wasn't as good as me but his dedication was there his yeah. consistency there you go and it, you, mm. you, it kind of and then you kind of don't want to watch football as much as well because then yeah. family members will say oh thing was playing today or such and such and you think I don't want to fucking know because you know your life was kind of slipping in and I never had anything else. Football yeah. was my thing as well, not yeah, to yeah. the level that you were. Yeah. And the limelight, but the talent was there to be something special. But yeah. that, that's hard as well. But yeah. then you sit in the pubs and then people say, oh, you were a great footballer and you kind of feel free oh, no. and it picks you up. But So when you started on the drink and the drugs, like, how long did that last? Um, so I was, I'd say about, nine, I want to say 20, something like that. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a really long period, but like, I was never a, a drinker, like so. I'm not like go to work, go in the pub and have a drink. <clears throat> when I used to go out and have a drink, I'd wait. I'd want to get drunk. Like, do you know what I mean? I was a bit, um, just a bit of, like too much. You know, instead of like, uh, what's, the, what's that when they call it a drinker when you're just non-stop social? Oh, alcoholic? No, not alcoholic. No, not like a social drinker. No, when it's just non-stop. I mean, like if you, I'd have to drink like a bottle of vodka. Mm -hmm. Like, do you know what I mean? As I say, I wouldn't go every day, but if I, if I went to go out for a drink, I would get smashed. Yeah. And I'd be in a complete state. Do you know what I mean? But then I might not touch it for ages. I didn't need to do it sort of all the time. But my where, well, where I weren't a sort of social, just have a couple and go home, I'd be thinking, if I'm going out to the pub, I need to get drunk sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I found myself in some proper sort of scenarios and states. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I, I, I ended up in a, there's a club in, in, in Essex called Faces which is a place that everyone used to go yeah. to. And it's that you can imagine the type of place, yeah. So we always end up in Faces. And I'd only been uh, drinking for, like, I'd only got a couple of weeks under my belt. i got my mates with me that have been about 13, 14, have been drinking and puffing for God knows how long. I'm like an amateur, right? And we're in Faces having a drink. And they said to us, there's an illegal rave in some place called Trent Park. Big acreage. Do you want to go? So I've had enough drinking me. I've gone, yeah, go on, let's go. Let's go to this illegal rave. Right? We're all suited and booted up, nice shoes. We've pulled up in this forest and uh, pulled up in the forest and like that, I think there was two cab loads of us. I'll never forget this. We've pulled up in this forest and um, the cab goes, what the fuck are you lot doing? Like, do you know what I mean? You're all dressed up. And you've just dropped us in the middle of a field. Anyway, we've walked into the field. All of a sudden, you could start to hear, dude, dude, 
the, like you could hear a little bit of music. So next thing you know, bosh, we're all in the forest, about 10 of us, and it's getting louder and louder. And we're thinking, we're all celebrating in the middle of the forest. We're going, yeah, we're getting there, we're nearly there. Anyway, boom, boom, next thing you know, it's going off. We've turned the corner. There's an illegal rave going on in the, in the middle of this forest. They've got like a netting over the top and like a netting's around the outside with like a, like bed sheets on it, like paint splattered on it. A little DJ area set up, a bar set up, and they're all like big piercings, big bright colourful air and this, that and the other. Else. And we've got in the, in, the, in the thick of it with them sort of thing. And um, as I said, I've only had a, really had a drink at that point. And they're sitting there and they're all having the, is it like, like laughing, gas things, this, that and the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And pills. I've never done anything in my life, have I? So I've said, they're, they're all eating pills, this, that and the other. So I've eaten, I've took half of one, nothing happened. So I took the other half. Mate, after about 20 minutes, I'm lying on the floor <laughs> in the field, <laughs> cuddling me mate, all warm, felt like I was in a bath. I'm going to him, bloody hell, this, that and the other. I was in the right state, do you know what I mean? But it was ended up being, looking back at it, Quite funny, but like then, like Jesus Christ, I ended yeah. up on the bus at like six o'clock in the morning, broad daylight, getting on the bus with all these punk rockers and all that. And they're going, Yeah, come back next week, man. We're going again. I'm going, Yeah, lovely. That was the first time. Like the first time you're thinking, You don't really feel no effects after, do you? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's yeah, nice. Nothing. <laughs> did you start thinking then when you started hitting the drink and the party and seeing like, how much did you think about your past? That what could have been? Did that play a massive part of your mindset? No, I don't, just kind of I, I think, block it out I think that's what, in. I think that's what it yeah. did. I think that actually helped me block that sort of sort of time out for a few years. Yeah, I think that's what it did. did any, I didn't really think about football yeah. at all, to be honest with you. Did anybody ever put like out a fucking missing sign like where's Sonny Pike? Like, did anybody ever ask those questions, or were you just yeah. kind of forgot about? No, yeah. You know the funny thing actually when I when when we was talking about who's going to do this interview, and you and and you say that a lot of people started messaging. Like internet was not long going and everything else. But I had a guy ring me up from a newspaper in Scotland, Scottish Sun. He said, we were during in, in Aberdeen in, an, in a university. It was a big, it was a thing going on that I'd gone to Scotland to hide, right? And stayed up in Scotland. I don't know if there's someone called Sonny in some, <laughs> up in there and saying he was playing football or whatever, but a lot of people have messaged me saying they thought I was in Scotland. Uh, like on a bit of a yeah, on changed a, your name or on something. a missing list, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like miss on on, on the missing list and gone up to Scotland. I was just like, what the fuck? Like just mad, yeah. isn't it? The things that people it, how it comes out. Yeah, but it's fucking just mad. Life is mad. Like from where that like you were, yeah, to then how it ended as well. Like, it is sad. But like, yeah. so man, everybody's got potential as well. Like, everybody's mm. can be the best version of themselves, and it's when. You're thrust into the limelight like that. It's obviously just burned you out and drained you out. Mm. How much do you? How far do you think you could have went though if you just stuck at playing football? Uh, I mean, technically, I always felt like I didn't really see anyone that I thought that was better than me. Uh, so, like that sort of side of it. But like you said, I really need just putting into like an academy or whatever it was then, and just left to concentrate on my football really, and just even become like uh, more physical and fit and that sort of side of it. I never really got to build all that sort of all them sort of aspects to my game that really got sort of completely ignored if I would have been sort of just put down and a bit quiet and just left alone to sort of concentrate and someone would have got older than me then I don't know really it's a hard question to ask but I'd like to think somewhere yeah. somewhere good how did the book come about who came forward for that was it yourself or did somebody come forward um I did an interview on talk sport about four years ago and Colin Murray, it was the first thing I'd ever done on like since anything. I mean, Sounds like great. that, yeah. And off the back of that, it sort of went viral. This in uh, this uh, in this interview, and then I started getting loads. Quite a few. I got like I'd never done a tweet before, and then I looked at my Twitter, and I got a thousand followers in a day off it. So like it sort of sort of put the wheels in motion. Let's say for some people was going to me, son, you got to write a book. Like the interview you just did, you got to write a book. So. Uh, that's that's when I sort of started that. How was it writing your book that bring back a lot of memories? Yeah, it did. Yeah, it was really good for me though. To be fair, it was good because I sort of broke it because it took quite a long time. Because I'm a black cab driver. At times when I was in the rank, I'd I just have my I'd have a couple of black books and I'd just write down little things that I remember. And by the end of it, these black books were just banged out with nonstop. And because of the like social media now, I'd I would. Uh, 
message people that I'd know from years ago and they'd say, oh yeah, I remember that. Do you remember this happened, this, that and the other? Like, uh, I remember something happened in Butlins when I was a kid and I was playing in a competition and all the kids come to uh, like beat me up after the game and this, that and the other. And he said, yeah, then me, uh, my old coach, Mark Coles, he come and pulled them off me and this, that and the other. Because I had quite a, a few things that happened to me, obviously, when I was younger. I actually uh, was sitting, I remember the first one, I was sitting there like in the cinema and was watching watching a film and just someone just tapped me on the, on the leg and said, son, there's about 30 kids outside. They're gonna, they want to give you an idea. I was like, what? The fear just like threw me, do you know what I mean? And I got outside and they was gone, thank God. But then I went outside my house and I was waiting at the park and then they waved me in. Um, so it was just, just things like that. But I, I wouldn't remember certain things, you know what I mean? But they were saying, yeah, that was that kid and this, that and the other. So you got to sort of go back mm-hmm. through it all. So then what age did you become a black hack driver? I was about, my, my daughter was six months old. She was born and she sort of gave me a bit of bit of a, an awakening. I was thinking to myself, right, I've got to sort myself out here because I was doing the building before that and uh, a lot of time I was getting a bit of work here, getting a bit of work there and I thought I need to be self-employed. I need to do something for myself. Uh, she was six months old. So I'd have been like, say, I want to say about 21, 23. I started doing the knowledge, took me three years. Uh, yeah, so like mid twenties, twenty six. Did you ever play football in your twenties? Did you ever go back to like amateur or five or six? Nothing. Nothing. Just nothing. Completely gave yeah. it up. I had a lot of phone calls for the first few years. Can you come oh. and play for like semi pro sides? And I just completely swerve it. Then I left it for ages, and I played like a couple of charity games. Now I think I played about two charity games. I know you're doing coaching as well. That's it now. Yeah. How so, did you get into that? Uh, and what made you get into it? After giving football up, did you feel as if you had something to give that to maybe guide the kids now? That maybe you know, I think that interview that I did mm-hmm. with uh, on Talksport made quite a big difference to my life. I think I, lo- I let a lot of stuff out, uh, and it gave me a big release. And I got quite a really good feedback of people, like sort of thing. I thought, you know what, ain't that bad? A lot of other people have struggled this, that, and the other, and it took a lot of weight off my shoulders. Uh, so I started to look at doing what, what I could do in football. And then my son was born. He starts to like football. And I think between the combination of them two things, sort of naturally, I've sort of ended up back in back in the game. And how are you feeling about it? Do you feel better about it? Happy? Yeah. No pressure? No pressure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Always a little bit, but I always put a little bit of pressure on myself because I want to be the best at what I do, naturally. But like um, nothing compared to then. Do you know what I mean? But if anything, through my experiences, I can sort of help other people now so uh yeah i do a lot of one-to-one and small groups like coaching uh mentoring kids that are uh, 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 wonder kids let's say i get a lot of messages off parents and like can you talk to me what do you think about my son should we do this should we do that i actually had one message me a few weeks ago his boy wants been scattered to go to ajax he's from england and i'm like well let's talk to him about this this that and the other i'm like yeah so it's nice in a way because like Obviously, through my experience now, I can sort of help out people in that way. Uh, so your mental health went at one point? Did your mental health go at one point, completely struggle at once? Yeah, yeah. Just thinking, what was that with? Just thinking about the past or just everything that came with it? I think there's just the pressure building up. Between 14 and 16 was the worst years. And then you just kind of suppressed it all? Yeah, and then after that, I sort of took, I had a couple of years where I was drinking, this, that and the other. And then after that, I think just normal life, maybe my daughter and everything else sort of kicked in and I sort of, sort of been back to normal since yeah, then. <laughs> that's a good thing, mate. And that, what about your son? How old's your son? He's seven. And what's the potential light you've got? Are you going to take it easy with him? Or? Yeah, yeah, I've got to take it easy with him. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. position is he playing? He plays in the middle or anywhere up front. <laughs> yeah. It's just runs full circle again, that mate. That is the thing, it? mate. It's scary. Yeah. Because I'm thinking like, Oh, it's another world, mate, because all of a sudden you're thinking like you want him to be in a good environment where he can play and get better, but at the same time I just want him to enjoy himself. Do you know what I mean? Because I know if he does get into that sort of academy and it gets a bit too serious, they get burnt out really yeah, quickly. Yeah. I mean, as I said, a lot of parents I spoke to and, and, and one of them saying to me like, he's getting a really big name. I said, do yourself a favour, avoid that name as much as, as long as you can because you're seeing it now. You see kids at 21, 22, in the first team, a, a bit of big sides, and they're, what's he doing? He ain't doing nothing compared to what he used to do. He's 21 still. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, still learning. It's fucking nuts. Like, Rooney yeah. did pretty well to hold on 
for as long as he did, I yeah, think. He'd done really well. Yeah, he was trying to see a lot of kids uh, pull through. I've seen a few kids at Man U as well come through the ranks, played some great games, six games, 12 games, and then they just kind of fizzle away as well. That's what I'm saying. Well, it doesn't, yeah. to keep to that standard is, is fucking, mm. it, it's near enough impossible. There's only a select few that can do yeah. it. And for Rooney to come through the ranks at 16 and score those goals and then yeah. and be one of the greatest strikers of all time, man. Like England's, was it England's all time? Goal yeah. scorer and Man U's, I think. Um, but unbelievable. Like to kick on, like that extra pressure doesn't do anybody no. any fucking good, though. Like that's the only thing, especially in the media here, hang out to fucking dry. Like yeah, they don't cool. fuck around me. No, 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 no. Ruthless, man. Like when did you start building the bridges again with your dad? I haven't. Still now? No, no, I haven't spoke to my dad since that conversation I told you about. Fucking hell, I thought you sorted it out a couple of years later. No, no, I haven't spoke to him since then. Did that play a massive part on you then? In which way? And just the struggling, the, the, the suppressing? Yeah, the... of course, because there's a lot of things. I mean, there's, 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 there's some things there that my dad, you'd probably say, hasn't done well, but there was a lot of things about him that he put into me that was really good. Do you know what I mean? Like that, that sort of mental strength that I had, Luckily, I've got back now. He put that into me, a lot of the stuff. Do you know what I mean? So that was tough. I could have obviously done, done with him at some of them mm -hmm. points when you've got people trying to give you ID and everything else in your team with all the, all the stresses and everything else. I could have probably yeah, definitely done with him. But I suppose at the same time, it's built me into the person I'm now where I can sort of do it. Oh, I just do everything on my own. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, because I know where you can ever reach out and try and... Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I never know. I never, you never know, you never know in life, do you? But yeah. is it, is it, is it, is a lot gone on now? Uh, so it's quite a tough one. Obviously, I've got my sisters to think about. Uh, I mean, even my mum passed away a couple of months Sorry, ago. Yeah, that, that's all right. No worries. So, um, uh, yeah, you never know what goes on there. Yeah, life is just never know what day it's just mate, day by day brother, it daily, right? yeah. it's fucking hell mate <laughs> one day there's hurricanes mate and the next there's a bit of sunshine mate but that's it. it's just fucking madness but again like for anybody that's watching any kids that's maybe got the, the fucking world at their feet and um this what advice would you give for them my advice would be to think long term don't be thinking like because there's a lot of you see a lot of these guys and young kids now they're like sort of social media kids and getting little boot deals and this that and the other it's easy for someone to come up to you, I'll give you some boots and get this and you get a couple of likes and this that and the other but it's a bit of a uh, my story a lot of the guys I talk to is like sort of a bit of a blueprint of what not to do now do you know what I mean because that wasn't nothing like the, the social media wasn't non-existent then but obviously now you see social media there's thousands of little sunny pikes now aren't there do you know what I mean got a lot of followers this that and the other just to keep it long term, just concentrate on what's most important to you. If, if that's your football, put the football first before everything, and and then and the rest of it comes. Do you know what I mean? You've got to take it. You've got to take it slow, like anything in life. Like was, yeah. Everything takes time. Anything worth doing takes ages. So just just keep that first. There's just so many stories like this. Like I had Billy Kenny on the uh, Everton. He came through the ranks. Man of the match against Liverpool. Next big mm. thing. Turned alcoholic. Nineteen. Got injured. No. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Never really clawed it back. Like, it's fucking hard, and it's painful to see as well like, the, the talent that's lost for mm. yeah, like booze and fucking drugs and all the madness. Yeah, and there's a lot of these people not even touched that when they have had their career, slight injuries or slight yeah, blips, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. they just kind of get a taste of it and they realise it don't take long to sort of swerve into another yeah. sort of area, like, like you say your environment in it you are what mm. the people's around you and that's and that's what happened to me i was sort of just sort of slipped into that sort of world and then uh, like even bits and pieces like with my stepdad he, he was up to no good i don't know if, if you look in the book he was up to up to really no good and uh i sort of even started to think about going down sort of flirting with the lines of going down them sort of routes at one point and you think to yourself what the yeah. fuck for do you know what i mean like, what's the plans for the future brother We've got big plans. Uh, yeah, 2022. We're having a go. Um, now, obviously, the book's not long come out, so mm -hmm. hopefully we want to try and get something else. Like maybe like, I'd like to do like a documentary or something like that, or even people have approached me to the possibility of a film. Um, and then in my football academy, try and get some more coaches. I've actually built my own five-a-side football pitch, which is like not a lot of one-to-one -one coaches have done that. I've actually built my own free, uh, 4G pitch. Uh, so I, I train now I've got a little indoor facility as well get some other coaches to work for me 
I'm actually thinking about maybe even trying to do like an app where I can send um, sessions off to players, but also like a mindset, like that little check-in so they can do things every every even if it's once a week or every other day, just sort of keep them mentally strong um, and help them in that way as well. Because I haven't seen anything like that. I've seen I've seen coaching apps with like you can do like practice some of my skills and touches but I ain't seen nothing with the two of them together like where you can talk about talking about building strong characters pretty much you know what I mean I'll give you a list in the morning or your son gets a list in the morning give me five things that a winner does and give me five things that someone a loser do you know what I mean just little things just to sort of help build them give them a bit of resilience and um, yeah that's that's what I'd like to do something like that Mm -hmm. Um, and that's it yeah obviously family that's all I'm about mate kids wife and kids mm-hmm. all my um, sisters and everything else just making sure i do as much as that that's a big job on the 22 list as well do some yeah. stuff with him is there any kid you watch now that heard maybe broke through the first thing you think that he's going to be a star i'm trying to think who's there out of talent that's playing professional there's a lot so much talent out there now yeah, man. there's just, just so trying much to think. there's nothing that comes to my mind at, at the minute but i've got a kids a few kids that I know that are younger, that not not first team, that that I think mm-hmm. could be a couple of good little players. But uh, you just know though, don't you? When you see, yeah, you look at a couple of them. That, they've got yeah. something special. Yeah, they've, yeah. they've got the talent, but have they got the the dedication and the mindset to then kick yeah. on and be and blossom into exactly who they can and be. all the environment around them is yeah. it all charged in the right direction to sort of move them in yeah. in that right way? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because things happen in your life normal that that could just change what you're doing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, well, brother, for coming on today and telling no your worries, story, mate. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Quickie Would you James. like to finish up on anything before we go? No, I'm good. I'm good, thank you. Just yeah. say hello to my wife, kids, uh, normal stuff. Yeah, good stuff. Let's not worry, wish you all the best for the future, mate. Tell her, mate. God bless nice you, mate. You. Thank you. Take care, mate.